Hello students. Today we're going to talk about the urinary system, chapter 26 in our book. Go through some of the anatomy and the physiology of kidney function. First, the urinary system consists of two kidneys, two ureters, one bladder, and one urethra. So the gross anatomy of the urinary system is quite simple with these with these organs and structures, as you know. The kidneys maintain homeostasis by regulating the water volume and the composition of electrolytes and other solutes, primarily in the blood. So here's a picture demonstrating the parts of the urinary system. You see the two kidneys. The tubes that lead from the kidneys are called the ureters, and the ureters carry urine from the kidney down to the urinary bladder, which is a temporary storage site for urine, and then urine exits the body via the urethra. So the gross anatomy is quite simple. As far as the functions of the kidney are concerned, the kidney regulates pretty much everything in the blood. It regulates the ionic compositions of ions. Here's a few, sodium, potassium, and chloride. Regulates blood pH. The kidneys are one of two organs in our body that regulate blood pH at the organ level. So the kidneys can adjust how much hydrogen ion, or acid, is in the blood relative to the buffer called bicarbonate, HCO3-. minus. This is a buffer. Um, the kidney regulates water volume. If we need, if we're dehydrated, the kidney saves water. So we increase water reabsorption, puts it back in the blood. And if we're overhydrated, the kidneys then excrete more water out in urine, which reduces the water volume in the blood, and thus blood pressure, but increases urinary output volume. So we're going to talk a little bit about this as we go through the packet. And then, obviously, blood pressure is regulated by the kidney as well ultimately in a couple of ways, but one way by adjusting this blood volume. Remember, blood volume is directly proportional to blood pressure. So if we have a high blood volume, higher than normal, your blood pressure is probably high. And so the kidneys would be directed to get rid of water in order to bring that blood pressure back down. And vice versa, if we're dehydrated, we don't have enough water you know, in our blood, then our blood pressure is low. And we talked about in chapter 21, hypovolemic shock. So when someone has a reduced blood volume, their blood pressure drops, and they then start going through hypovolemic shock, which we're not going to revisit in this chapter. But nonetheless, the kidneys also produce some hormones for us, regulate the concentration of solutes in the blood, which is called osmolarity. Uh, you probably recall calcitriol, covered that in the endocrine chapter, and erythropoietin, which was covered in the blood chapter. <clears throat> so the kidneys produce these hormones, which obviously help regulate physiology in the body in their own way. And then the kidneys excrete metabolic waste, and foreign substances like certain drugs and toxins can be excreted out in urine. And then our blood glucose level is also regulated by the kidney. So here is the kidney. Let's go over some of its anatomical features real quick. The kidneys are surrounded by a capsule. Just deep to that capsule, the outer part of the kidneys is called the renal cortex. <clears throat> deep to the renal cortex is what is called the renal medulla. So all in here is the renal medulla. The renal medulla is composed of these darker little areas, which are called the renal pyramids. The tip of a renal pyramid, at the very bottom right here, is called the renal papilla. In between the renal pyramids is a tissue in the, the medulla called the renal columns. Extending from the cortex and down into a, the medulla are the functional units of the kidney that we have to talk about called a nephron. The nephrons perform three physiological tasks in order to produce urine, which is the waste product of kidney function. And that urine ultimately is collected out of the tip of each pyramid at the renal papilla, 
and an opening right here, which is called a minor calyx. The minor calyces, plural, join together from multiple pyramids to form what is called a, a major calyx. So we have the minor calyces, and then you have a major calyx, and the major calyces then join to form a larger opening where all the urine is collecting. This is called the renal pelvis. Urine then leaves the renal pelvis to go into this hollow tube called the ureter, which carries the urine down to the urinary bladder. Now we need to know the blood flow through the kidney. However, you're not going to be identifying these blood vessels on the test and lecture. You still have to know the order in which blood enters and then leaves the kidney. The reason why that's important is because blood flow through the kidney is exactly what drives kidney function. So the blood flow through the kidney is allowing the kidney to work, in other words. So let's go through uh, the blood flow in and then back out. Blood is going to leave the aorta, which is not shown, and go into a renal artery. And these arteries and veins in the ureter enter and leave at this indented part of the kidney, which is called the hilum, the renal hilum or hilus, the renal hilum. So blood comes in via the renal artery. The renal artery then subdivides and branches into what are called segmental arteries. The segmental arteries then branch into arteries that go up the renal columns in between the pyramids. And those arteries that go up the renal column is referred to as an interlobar artery. So blood enters and goes up towards the cortex through the interlobar artery, and the blood then goes into an artery that arches over the top of each pyramid. The arteries that arch over the top of the pyramids are called the arcuate arteries. From the arcuate artery, blood goes up into a little bitty artery that goes perpendicular up and down through the renal cortex. Those little arteries that go up into the cortex are called the cortical radiate arteries. From the cortical radiate artery, blood is going to go into the most important arteriole in the kidney. So let's go to this enlarged picture. Blood goes from this cortical radiate artery directly into what's called the afferent arteriole. So this afferent arteriole carries blood into the filter in the kidney that's responsible for filtering the blood, which is called the glomerulus. So the glomerulus is the filter in the kidney. It is a capillary bed. It receives blood from the afferent arteriole. Now this capillary bed is is very special. It's different from other capillary beds in the body for several reasons. One, it has an arterial feed and it has an arterial drain. So blood's going to come into the, the glomerular capillaries via the afferent arteriole and then blood's going to leave via what's called the efferent arteriole. The blood leaving the glomerulus via the efferent arteriole then enters into one of two capillary networks. In the renal cortex, the capillary network is called the peritubular capillary network, or the peritubular capillaries. The peritubular capillaries then drain blood down, well, the second one is called the vasa recta, that's in the medulla. So blood leaving the efferent arteriole goes into the peritubular capillary network up here in the cortex, and it goes into what's called the vasa recta. Now from those capillary beds, blood is going to drain back down into the peritubular venules that go to the cortical radiate vein. The cortical radiate vein is the little blue vein, little blue vessel up in the cortex. So blood's going to leave the, these capillaries and drain back into the cortical radiate vein that drains down to the arcuate vein, those are the veins that arch over the tip of a pyramid, and then down through the interlobar vein, which goes between the pyramids in a column, and from the interlobar veins, the blood goes into a segmental vein, then out 
of the kidney via the renal vein, and blood from here would go into the inferior vena cava, which is not shown. So we're not identifying all these blood vessels, but you should know them in order so you can learn that off of this flow chart. Please review the animations that are in the video so that will help you out learning the material. So let's go over the structures of a nephron. The nephrons are the functional units in the kidney that allows the kidney to regulate all aspects of the blood by producing either dilute urine or concentrated urine. And there are different components of the nephron. Really, it's made of two main things. The nephrons are made up of what's called a renal corpuscle. That's this circular structure that you see right here. That renal corpuscle is composed of a capsule that I'm going to show you in a minute, and inside of it is the glomerular capillaries, which are the filter to filter the blood. Connected to the renal corpuscle at the capsule, called the glomerular capsule or Bowman's capsule, is the second part of a nephron called the renal tubule. The renal tubule is the tube that will carry the filtration product from blood called filtrate into this tube and it only ever flows in one direction. There are different parts of the tube. The first part of the tube is called the proximal convoluted tubule that leads into what's called the loop of Henle or the nephron loop which has two parts. The nephron loop or the loop of Henle has a descending limb the filtrate comes down and it has an ascending limb where the filtrate comes back up. Then that leads into what we call the distal convoluted tubule. So that's the part of a nephron. Proximal tube, descending and ascending limbs of the loop of Henle, or another name for that is called the nephron loop. And then the distal convoluted tubule. <laughs> the renal corpuscle contains that glomerulus which is receiving blood from the afferenteriole and dra blood drains from the glomerulus via the efferenteriole. It's surrounded by the glomerular capsule or something called Bowman's capsule and on the outside of the glomerular capillaries are a special layer of cells called podocytes which form the visceral layer of the capsule. The parietal layer of the capsule is formed by the simple squamous cells on inside the capsule itself. I'm going to show you that picture. So here's the picture of the renal corpuscle with some detail. This is the afferenteriole. It's going to carry blood into the, cap the glomerular capillary loops. And the efferenteriole is going to carry the blood out. Now the blood pressure on the inside of this capillary bed is important because it is directly what drives the filtration of blood through what's called the filtration membrane. So when blood pressure is high in here, as it is higher in here than other capillary beds in the body, it forces fluid and solutes out into this space. This is called the intercapsular space. So the filtrate flows into this little bowl structure and then into the renal tubule. The first part is called the proximal convoluted tubule. On the outside of the glomerular capillaries are these special kind of strange looking cells adhering to the outside of them. Those are called podocytes. They form a part of the filtration membrane and what we call the visceral layer of the membrane of the capsule. So this is the visceral layer because they adhere directly to the capillary bed. The parietal layer of the Bowman's capsule are the simple squamous cells that line the inside of the capsule directly. So that would be the parietal layer. So in between the parietal layer and the visceral layer is where filtrate is being collected from the filtration process. So here's the filtration membrane. It's made of three, three parts. And I only want you to know what, well, basically the name of the three parts and really what that section of the membrane is preventing from being filtered. So it's kind of a strange picture, so let me just explain to you what you're looking at. This represents the capillary itself. 
Now the endothelium of the capillary, and that's what's represented by this Swiss cheese looking picture, that's the endothelium of the capillary is called a fenestrated capillary because they have large little gaps or holes between the endothelial cells that make up the capillary itself. So blood flows on the inside of here. The pressure of the blood in here forces fluid and solutes out through the fenestrations. Now, the first part of the filtration membrane is the endothelium itself, the fen fenestrated endothelial cells. So everything can be filtered out of the blood through the first part of this membrane, filtration membrane, except for blood cells. Platelets, red cells, and white cells can't fit through those holes. But all the fluid and all the solutes and proteins in the blood, they can come out. But immediately they hit the second part of the filtration membrane, which is the basement membrane of the glomerular capillary. So the basement membrane of the glomerulus prevents large proteins from being filtered out. So large proteins are going to be retained back into the blood from the basement membrane. The last part of the filtration membrane is called the slit membrane. It actually is a membrane that forms between these cytoplasmic membrane extensions off of the podocyte. These are called pedicles. And where they interlock from one podocyte to another one, they form this filtration slit membrane. That is the last part of the filter, which blocks medium-sized proteins from being filtered out of the blood and becoming part of the filtrate. So ultimately, when we filter the blood, the filtrate is chemically similar to plasma, except there's no blood cells and platelets that are being filtered out. There's no large plasma proteins being filtered out, and there's no medium-sized proteins. Some small, small proteins can be le leaked out at the filtration membrane, but a very, very small amount. So everything in the blood pretty much gets filtered out, good stuff, bad stuff, through glomerular filtration, except you don't filter your blood cells out, you don't filter platelets out, and you don't filter your proteins out. Only trace amounts of proteins are, can be in, in the urine. So this is the filtration membrane. Just learn what it is preventing from being lost when we filter the blood through the capillary bed. Now there are two basic types of nephrons in the kidney. The first one is called a cortical nephron. They comprise about 80 to 85 percent of all the nephrons in the kidney. So they're the, the most numerous. There's about 1 million nephrons in each kidney. So that means there's up to around 850,000 nephrons that are called cortical nephrons. So these cortical nephrons uh, have their, their characteristic is that they have their renal corpuscle higher up in the cortex. They have very short loops of Henle that barely dip down into the medulla. And the peritubular capillary network is what circles around the cortical nephron tubule. These nephrons typically create urine that has an osmolarity similar to blood, meaning that the concentration of the solutes in that urine is similar to the concentration of solutes in the blood. So here's a diagram of it. We're not identifying this on the test, but we need to know the parts of it. Um, you can see in, in this picture they have a detailed view of the blood vessels coming to and from the nephron. So this, this line right here represents what's called the, the cortical medullary line or junction, the separation of the cortex and the medulla. You can see the renal corpuscle up here is higher in the cortex. It has a very short loop of Henle. We see the arcuate artery here which arches over the top of a pyramid. This would represent the renal pyramid. Blood then goes up into the cortical radiate artery, into an afferent arteriole, and then into the glomerulus where we filter, filter, filter the blood out and form the filtrate that goes into the renal tubule. Blood leaves the glomerulus via the efferent arteriole, goes through the peritubular capillary network, and ultimately drains back into a cortical radiate vein which drains into an arcuate vein. From there, just to recap, 
blood goes down the, from the arcuate vein down the renal columns through interlobar vessels, then into segmental vessels, and then into either, in this case, leaving would be the renal vein. So let's talk about the juxtamedullary nephron. The juxtamedullary nephron is called that because it has its renal corpuscle deeper in the cortex. Basically, it lies just adjacent to the medulla, and that's what this word means. Juxtamedullary means adjacent to the medulla. So they have their renal corpuscles deeper in the cortex, and they have longer loops of Henle. They have both the peritubular capillaries and a capillary bed in the medulla called the vasa recta, which circles around the renal tubule. I'm going to tell you why this is important in a second. So those capillary beds circle around the renal tubule of a juxtamedullary nephron. The ascending limb of the loop of Henle or the nephron loop has a thick region and a thin region. The thick region, as we're going to learn in a little while in the ascending limb, is impermeable for water movement. But nonetheless, this particular type of nephron, which comprises about 15%, of all of the nephrons in the kidney, 15 to 20. That means it's about 150,000 of them or so in each kidney. They produce urine that is concentrated, has a higher concentration of solutes than the blood. Here's a picture of it. Here's the renal corpuscle. It's closer to that cortical medullary line or junction. It's deeper in the cortex. It has a very long loop of Henle that dips almost all the way down to the tip of the pyramid, which is called the renal papilla. We still see all the blood vessels, the cortical radiate artery supplying blood into the afferent areole, the glomerulus where filtration takes place, the efferent arteriole carrying blood away from the glomerular filter. Blood then goes through this particular capillary bed in the medulla, which is called the vasa recta and also in the capillary bed up in the cortex, which is called the peritubular capillary network. Oh, and just a point of interest, if anyone is in lab, where, when we do have to identify these blood vessels, the way you're going to know that the afferent arteriole is, and the efferent arteriole, the distinction between them, is that the afferent arteriole is the only branch that comes off of a cortical radiate artery. Notice the efferent arteriole never connects to the cortical radiate artery. So that's how you're going to know the difference when you're looking at uh, an up-close part of the model that we have to do in lab. All right, so let's go over the physiology of urine formation. The formation of urine only involves three things. Basically, the kidney performs three physiological tasks in order to produce urine. The kidneys have to filter the blood at the glomerulus in the renal corpuscle. That's called glomerular filtration. Now remember, the filter membrane has three components to it, and it really only blocks the filtering of your blood cells and platelets and your protein. Everything else is filtered out, water, waste products, and good things like glucose, amino acids, vitamins, ions. So the filtrate itself is chemically, the composition of it is chemically similar to that of blood, my, plasma, minus your blood cells, platelets, and, and proteins, large and medium-sized proteins. Once we filter the blood at the glomerulus via glomerular filtration, the filtrate flows into the renal tubule. And remember, the renal tubule has several components to it. There's a proximal tube, there's that loop, of Henle or nephron loop, descending and ascending loops, and then a distal convoluted tubule. That distal convoluted tubule then drains into what's called a collecting duct, and I'll show you that when we get there uh, in a little while. So the filtrate flows down this tube. The next two parts of urine formation is, or I should say involves, reclaiming any good substances that just got filtered out, we have to put them back into the blood where they came from. We don't always just want to lose all of our good solutes that we need. So we have to reclaim substances that got filtered out and put it back into the blood. This is where the peritubular 
capillary network and the vasa recta come into play. That's what this represents right here, this capillary bed that encircles the renal tubule. So we have a chance to take anything that we filtered out if we need it and put it back into the blood. That's called tubular reabsorption. On the other hand, so we can reclaim substances. And then we're going to go through some of that in a minute. On the other hand, look at the filter. We have blood coming in the afferent areole. High pressure forces fluid and solutes out and forming the filtrate. But then the blood is leaving as well. So there are some substances that actually bypass the filter because they're leaving via the efferent arteriole. So if there's any substances that we did not get to filter out, they enter the efferent arteriole, go into the peritubular network and the vasa recta, and we can secrete them from the blood directly into the tube. That's called tubular secretion. So we have to filter the blood, we have to reabsorb substances, and then we have to secrete substances back into the tube. By the time the filtrate reaches the end of the tube, we have what is called urine. And that urine is the product of renal function. So the kidneys, as everyone knows, produces urine. But urine is is created in these three ways and by reabsorbing and secreting we are altering the composition of solutes in the plasma as well and we're going to talk about how the kidney is adjusting water volume or electrolyte volume um, and how the kidney deals with pH a little bit so in order to regulate how quickly the kidneys filter blood at the glomerulus we have to deal with a couple of things. One, there is an apparatus called the juxtaglomerular apparatus. Its main role is to help regulate something called glomerular filtration rate. That's the rate at which we filter the blood at the glomerulus. The juxtaglomerular apparatus is formed where the ascending loop makes contact with the afferent arteriole. And where the, <clears throat> the ascending loop makes contact with the afferent arteriole, the cells become specialized. The cells in the afferent arteriole where that contact is made are referred to as the juxtaglomerular cells. And if you remember in previous chapters, I told you that the JG cells produce renin, which helps regulate blood pressure. The cells on the ascending loop that are making contact with the afferent arteriole also become specialized. They become a salt detector, a salt detector in the filtrate, and they're called the macula densa. So the macula densa and the juxtaglomerular cells are going to be important in regulating kidney function, specifically the glomerular filtration rate, and ultimately, renin from the JG cells helps regulate, globally, regulate blood pressure. So here's the renal corpuscle again. I just wanted to show you where the, J, uh, the juxtaglomerular apparatus is located. I know you can't tell from this picture, but this part, this is part of the renal tubule. This part of the renal tubule is the top part of the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. It's cut in half so we can see it. And where the ascending limb makes contact with the afferent arteriole, the cells in the afferent arteriole become specialized, and they basically are modified smooth muscle cells called the juxtaglomerular cells, and they produce renin. The cells on this side of the ascending limb of the loop of Henle that touch the afferent arteriole become specialized, they are modified, kind of small, crowded, columnar-looking cells that are called the macula densa. The macula densa are salt detectors. They basically monitor how much sodium chloride is in the filtrate by the time the filtrate passes this part of the tube. So glomerular filtration is driven by blood pressure in the glomerular capillaries directly. And that pressure in the glomerular capillary has to be higher than the opposing pressure forces. 
So glomerular filtration is driven by the blood pressure in the glomerulus. It's called glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure. It's opposed by the hydrostatic pressure in the capsule called capsular hydrostatic pressure and by the blood colloid osmotic pressure. So water and small molecules move out of the glomerulus during filtration and we filter about 180 liters of fluid a day. But almost all of that is reclaimed via tubular reabsorption. So the glomerular filtration rate is the amount of filtrate that both kidneys produce in one minute is called the glomerular filtration rate now that is a pretty important controlled condition that has to be monitored and regulated because if the glomerular filtration rate is too high that means the filtrate is going to move through the renal tubule too quickly and we're not going to be able to reabsorb the substances that we need to put back into the blood and we're going to lose those substances to urine. On the other hand, if the glomerular filtration rate is too low, then we reabsorb too many substances back into the blood and we don't adequately get rid of waste products. So let me go back to the other picture and, and explain this a little bit. Let's go back to this, this nephron picture. So what I didn't tell you when we covered the three physiological steps is what moves or drives the filtrate to move through the renal tubule. There's no pump in here. It's not pumping the filtrate through. <clears throat> so what moves the filtrate, and it has to be a constant movement, what moves that filtrate through the renal tubule is the formation of more filtrate. So we filter, fluid comes out, goes in a tube. You filter again, fluid comes out, goes in a tube. So every time we're filtering filtrate out, it pushes the filtrate in front of it forward. So if we're filtering too quickly, the filtrate moves through the tube too quickly, and you're losing needed substances out in urine. On the other hand, if you filter too slowly, the filtrate moves too slowly through the tube, and you have too much time to reabsorb substances back in the blood and thus you don't you don't excrete waste products effectively out in urine so for that reason the glomerular filtration rate or from now on I'm going to just say GFR has to be regulated pretty precise precisely so here is uh, an, an, just another picture of the renal corpuscle just to reiterate we have uh, blood coming into the glomerular capillaries via the afferent arteriole. The pressure of the blood pressure in the capillary bed is called the glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure. You don't have to go and memorize these numbers, but I left this on here so you can see what the math works out to be. So the pressure in here is kind of high. It's 55, around 55 millimeters of mercury of pressure. That's a lot higher than other capillary beds in the body. So the, the blood coming in so the capillary loops has a high pressure, and then we have blood leaving via the efferent arteriole. Now, there are basically two reasons why the blood pressure in these capillaries are higher here than other capillary beds in the body. One, the entry point of blood coming in via the afferent arteriole, the afferent arteriole is larger in diameter, which you can barely see on the picture. So we have a larger volume of blood that comes in then can leave over time because the efferent arteriole is smaller in diameter. So you have larger amounts of blood coming in than leaving over time, so pressure builds up in the middle. That's one reason. Another reason is because these capillary loops, the glomerular capillary loops, are quite long. They're longer in a more confined space than other capillary loops or beds in our body. And the longer that blood is in those capillaries, pressure builds up into them. So we have the glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure, which is 55 millimeters of mercury. You have high, uh, capsular hydrostatic pressure. That's the back pressure of the fluid in the, in the intercapsular space pushing back against the capillaries, trying to prevent fluid from coming out. So that is trying to inhibit filtration. It's about 15 millimeters of mercury of pressure. And then we have blood colloid osmotic pressure, which tries to pull fluid back in 
to the blood itself. So the way we calculate net filtration pressure for glomerular filtration rate is you have to take your glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure and subtract the other two numbers. The capsular hydrostatic pressure and the blood colloid osmotic pressure are trying to prevent filtration, whereas the glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure is trying to promote filtration. So when you do that math, you come out with a 10 millimeter of mercury pressure on the positive side, which means you always filter. So here's a little uh, animation you can view for renal filtration that will help you out a lot. So let's talk about GFR a little bit. Number one, the average amount of filtrate that forms in males every minute is slightly higher than females, give or take male and female body size. Again, you don't have to memorize these numbers, but it's about 125 milliliters per minute, which is a lot. So the kidneys are filtering 125 milliliters of plasma every minute forming filtrate. So that GFR then has to be regulated. It's regulated in three ways. Something called renal autoregulation. That means the kidney can regulate it on its own, autoregulation. The autonomic nervous system can regulate it to a degree. That's called neural regulation. And there are several hormones that we've already learned about that we're going to revisit that actually affect GFR can increase or decrease GFR. So let's look at renal autoregulatory mechanisms first. The autoregulation of GFR involves two things, something called the myogenic mechanism. This one happens the quickest and, in, and involves the contraction or relaxation of the smooth muscle in the walls of the afferent arteriole. So let me explain to you how this is going to work. Let's say that systemic blood pressure increases out in the body. That increased blood pressure is going to reach the kidney. It then, that increased blood pressure, will hit the afferent arteriole and stretch the wall of the afferent arteriole. When the wall of the afferent arteriole is stretched, that means that the blood pressure going into the glomerulus is too high and thus GFR is going to be too high. So the automatic response of that increased pressure to the afferent arteriole because the walls are being stretched is for the smooth muscle to contract. And when the smooth muscle contracts, it causes vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole. And if you vasoconstrict the afferent arteriole, you decrease the blood pressure in the glomerulus, which decreases GFR. And so that happens, and the GFR comes back down to its normal level, and then everything goes back to the normal way it was working. So let me go back to this picture and explain this a little bit further. So the main driving force for filtration, there are two. I've got to explain another one in a second. But one of the main forces that drives filtration is the pressure in the capillary bed. One way that you can adjust the pressure in the glomerulus is by altering the diameter of the afferent arteriole. For instance, if I wanted to increase the pressure inside the capillary bed, I want to try and increase how much blood volume can reach the glomerular capillaries. So if I want to increase blood volume in here to increase pressure, I'm going to vasodilate the afferent arteriole. If you vasodilate the afferent arteriole, then more blood volume comes in than leaves over time because the efferent arteriole is smaller in diameter and the pressure builds up in the middle. On the other hand, if GFR is too high and we're filtering, filtering, filtering too quickly, one quick way to bring the blood pressure down in the glomerulus and thus decrease GFR is to vasoconstrict the afferent arteriole. If we vasoconstrict the afferent arteriole, you decrease the blood volume that can enter the glomerulus and thus decrease its pressure. So that is what the myogenic mechanism is dealing with. So if the blood pressure is too high and the afferent arteriole stretches, then smooth muscle is going to contract. We vasoconstrict the afferent arteriole. It decreases glomerular blood hydrostatic pressure, which reduces GFR back down 
to its normal level. Now this myogenic mechanism happens in seconds, happens very quickly, automatically as well. That's why this is part of renal autoregulation. The tubular glomerular feedback mechanism takes a little bit longer to help regulate GFR, but it's, it's very effective. So the tubular glomerular feedback operates by monitoring how much salt or sodium chloride is in the filtrate. So let's say that the systemic blood pressure is high. That systemic blood pressure ultimately reaches the kidney, which increases glomerular filtration rate. If the glomerular filtration rate is too high, that means the fluid is going to move through the renal tubule too quickly, in which case we're not going to be reabsorbing sodium and chloride and water efficiently, which means there's going to be too much salt in the filtrate by the time it reaches the ascending limb of the loop of Henle where the macula densa is located. So if there's too much salt in the filtrate, by the time the filtrate reaches the macula densa level, the macula densa says, hey, wait a minute. They don't really talk, but you get the point. The macula densa says, hey, wait a minute. There's too much sodium chloride in the filtrate. That means that the filtrate is moving too fast through the renal tubule. And what causes the filtrate to move through the renal tubule, but nothing more than glomerular filtration rate. So if the filtrate's moving too fast and we're not reabsorbing salt, that means the GFR is too high. And so the macula densa, when it detects a high salt concentration, it blocks the release of the vasodilator nitric oxide. In the absence of nitric oxide, the afferent arteriole constricts, which decreases glomerular blood pressure and thus decreases GFR. So let me go back to that picture real quick one more time and tell you a little bit more about the diameters of the afferent and efferent arteriole. The afferent arteriole is larger in diameter than the efferent arteriole because there's always a little bit of release of nitric oxide and also because of its anatomy, but the release of nitric oxide in here causes a smooth muscle to relax and we get vasodilation. So if the GFR is too high, the filtrate moves too quickly through the tube, that means that we're not reabsorbing salt. So let me find the nephron picture up here real quick and I'll come back. So here we go. We filter, filter, filter through the tube too quickly. Now we're moving the filtrate too quickly through the tube. We can't reabsorb salt very efficiently. And so sodium chloride is highly concentrated by the time it reaches this part of the tube. And that's where the macula densa is located. And so the macula densa says, hey, wait, there's too much salt in the tube. That means the filtrate's moving too quickly. And it's moving too quickly because GFR is too high. So in order to try and reduce GFR, you have to reduce glomerular blood pressure. So in order to reduce glomerular blood pressure, you have to constrict the afferent arteriole. And that happens with the tubular glomerular feedback mechanism because of the blocking of nitric oxide. Now here's a, a, a flow chart, <coughs> excuse me, for the negative feedback loop to regulate GFR. So the controlled condition is GFR, the macula densa are the receptors that monitor sodium chloride and water, and when they detect that there's too much sodium chloride and water in the renal tubule, they then decrease their, the release of nitric oxide from the juxtaglomerular apparatus. In the absence of nitric oxide, you get a vasoconstriction of the afferent arteriole, which reduces blood flow into the glomerulus which reduces glomerular blood pressure and reduces GFR. So this loop is going to run and run and run until GFR is back to normal as determined by the macula densa detecting salt in the filtrate. Now, as far as the autonomic nervous system is concerned, the sympathetic nervous system supplies 
postganglionic neurons to the blood vessels in the kidney. And when the sympathetic nervous system fires, if you remember from AMP1, the sympathetic nervous system fires when you're physically active and you're working out or if you're very scared or nervous or you're in a, some emergency situation, you go through a fight or flight response. We talked about hemorrhaging as well in chapter 21. So all of those situations, excuse me, all of those situations cause sympathetic stimulation and that sympathetic stimulation causes the afferent arteriole to constrict. So sympathetic stimulation is going to reduce GFR by causing afferent arteriole constriction, and that reduces GFR, which reduces urine formation and thus urinary output. Now, that is important because during a sympathetic event, we're trying to reroute blood away from the non-essential organs, which does include our kidney, your digestive system, and your reproductive system if you're in an emergency situation or if you're extremely working out. We need that blood to go to your skeletal muscles, your heart, your brain, your lungs, and your liver during a fight or flight response. So the sympathetic nervous system decreases urinary output volume, which means we also conserve water. You're not losing your water to urine. You're maintaining your water in the blood, which helps maintain and increase blood volume and thus pressure. As far as hormonal regulation of GFR, we talked about all of these hormones before. We need to revisit them. Angiotensin II has the job of decreasing GFR. It does so by causing the afferent and the efferent arterioles to constrict. So you, need, you should remember that angiotensin II is produced when our blood volume and our blood pressure is too low. So if our blood volume and our blood pressure is too low, we need to try and increase it. So if your blood volume is too low, you don't want to lose any, any water in urine. So one way that we can slow down the loss of water in urine is by decreasing GFR, which reduces urinary output. So angiotensin II constricts the afferent and efferent arteriole, which reduces glomerular blood pressure, which reduces GFR, and now the, the filtrate moves very slowly through the tube and you reabsorb all of your water back into the blood. Atrial natriuretic peptide is actually produced by cells in the posterior portion of the, of the right atrium in the heart, and it's produced when the blood volume and blood pressure is too high. So the atria become stretched, they release atrial natriuretic peptide, and a -N, which is called ANP, and ANP tries to increase GFR, and by increasing GFR, you increase filtrate flow rate through the renal tubule, and you can dump water out in urine. So you would increase urinary output volume and also dump out more water. That brings the blood volume back down and brings your blood pressure back down to normal. So atrial natriuretic peptide actually decreases GFR in a slightly different manner than how angiotensin II, I'm sorry, atrial natriuretic peptide increases GFR in a slightly different manner than how angiotensin II decreases GFR. So angiotensin II's primary role in decreasing GFR is to decrease glomerular blood pressure. Atrial natriuretic peptide doesn't necessarily alter the blood pressure in the glomerulus, but rather it changes the surface area on the glomerular capillaries, which is available for filtration. And the surface area on the glomerular capillaries is regulated by these cells, mesangial cells. So I'm going to have to, let me see if I have that picture. I don't. Let me, let me go back to this picture real quick so I can explain this. They don't have them in this picture. They have them here. So there, there really are two ways that GFR is being controlled in here with pressure. Uh, I'm so, how we filter is controlled in two main ways. Number one, the blood pressure in the glomerulus drives filtration. That's a given. You increase the pressure, you filter faster. You decrease the pressure, 
you filter more slowly. The second way that we can adjust filtration rate, really, by instead of just altering blood pressure, which in altering blood pressure is controlled by altering the afferent arterial diameter. The second way that we can alter GFR, though, is by changing the availability of the surface area of the capillary for filtration. That's controlled by these mesangial cells. So, let me tell you a little analogy to try and explain this. If everyone knows what a soaker hose is in your garden, a soaker hose is a hose that when you turn the water on, water seeps out of the hose all the way down the length of the hose into the garden because it's porous. Well, the, the, the soaker hose is the analogous part to the glomerular capillary, okay? So, as it turns out, the glomerular capillary, the entire length of the glomerular capillary is not open for filtration to occur through. So let's go back to our soaker hose. If you can envision taking that soaker hose and wrapping one foot sections with duct tape and then leave a, section, a foot section that's open with no duct tape and then duct tape one more foot, leave a foot open, duct tape another foot, so forth and so on, down the length of the soaker hose, if you turn the water on, where's the water going to come out at? From the hose. It's not going to come out where you put the duct tape. It's only going to come out where the hose is exposed. So my analogy is this. The soaker hose is the glomerular capillary. The duct tape are the mesangial cells. So now if you take your soaker hose that you put duct tape on and you remove all of the duct tape, you will now have water being able to seep out of the entire hose again. So basically what you just did by removing the duct tape is you've increased the surface area of the hose via which water could leave the hose. So we can do the same thing with the glomerular capillaries. All we have to do is remove the duct tape, which are the mesangial cells. And so if we can move these mesangial cells away from the capillary wall, you expose more of the capillary for filtration to occur, and thus you have more filtrate being formed. So that is exactly what atrial natriuretic peptide does. A and P relaxes the mesangial cells away from the glomerular capillary, which increases the capillary surface for filtration, and thus we increase GFR. So angiotensin II decreases GFR and reduces urinary output. Atrial, natri atrial natriuretic peptide, or AMP, increases GFR, which increases urinary output. So here are the summations for the regulations of GFR. I want you to learn the major stimulations for each one of the mechanisms, what the mechanism of action is, and if it's increasing or decreasing GFR. And notice all of these are trying to decrease except for this one, which is going to increase. Now, we have to talk about a little bit more detail about tubular reabsorption and tubular secretion. So, when we filter the blood, we form the filtrate. That filtrate then moves through the renal tubule, and almost all of the filtrate that we form is actually reabsorbed. Only about 1% of what we filter out actually becomes part of urine. So you're going to, reabs you're going to filter out all you know, uh, waste products and good things like water, glucose, amino acids, ions, vitamins. All of this stuff is filtered out. We're going to have to reabsorb all of that in order to stay healthy, put it back in the blood. The secretion mechanism in the renal tubule helps us get rid of toxic substances, excess waste products, and helps manage blood pH. And I'm going to show you the cells that do that. In order to reabsorb solutes from the filtrate, 
back into the blood, the solutes can go through the tubule cells in two ways. Something called paracellular reabsorption, and that's where the it's a passive fluid that leaks between, with some solutes, leaks between the cells that line the tube. It's called paracellular because the reabsorption is occurring on the side of the tube. There's also transcellular reabsorption where the water and the solutes have to go directly through the cells that line the tube. So here's a picture of it. Here's paracellular reabsorption. They're kind of showing you sodium in water and other solutes do the same thing. They get between the cells directly. This is the lumen of the, of the tube. These are the tubule cells. And then here is the interstitial space. And then the blood capillary, peritubular capillary network. So we just filtered out and form our blood and formed filtrate. The solutes can go passively between the cells into the blood, and that's called paracellular reabsorption. However, we also have what's called transcellular reabsorption. Transcellular means through the cell. So you're going to reabsorb from what's called the apical membrane through the cell and out the basolateral membranes to go back into the blood. So in this case, we have sodium being shown. Sodium is passively going to come in down its gradient. Remember, you open a channel for sodium. It always wants to go into the cells of the body. And then we have active transporters at the basolateral membrane that actively pump sodium back out and allow it to get into the blood. So paracellular between the cells, transcellular reabsorption is through the cells. So we have some transporters that we have to talk about. The active transporters that use ATP, like the, the, the pump that you learned about a long time ago in one of the other biology classes, a sodium-potassium pump. So, the sodium-potassium pump uses a large amount of ATP. At rest, it uses about 6% of your body's ATP, which is a fairly good amount um, of ATP trying to control kidney function. The secondary active transporters are transporters that don't use ATP energy directly, but they use the electrochemical gradient of the ion that was set up from an active transporter moving ions in and out of the cell. So that's called secondary active transporter. The secondary active transporters can move two or more substances in the same direction, in which case we call them symporters, and there are secondary active transporters that move two or more substances in opposite directions they're called antiporters, which we're going to look at some of those in a second. Now, as far as water reabsorption is concerned, about 90 percent, 85 to 90 percent of all the water that's reabsorbed is called obligatory because water is going to follow the solutes from the renal tubule back into the blood. There are certain parts of the renal tube that are impermeable for water movement. But the parts that allow water to move through it, the water will follow the solutes, and that's how we reabsorb the majority of our water. However, about 15 to 20 percent, uh, 15 to 10 percent, 10 to 15 percent of the water that's reabsorbed is controlled by antidiuretic hormone, and that is called facultative water reabsorption. And we'll talk about ADH again in a minute. So you remember that ADH is antidiuretic hormone is a water conservation hormone. It makes your kidneys reabsorb water. So basically about 10 to 15 percent of our water being reabsorbed in our kidney is regulated by ADH. So let's talk about some of these symporters and antiporters. Reabsorption and secretion in the proximal convoluted tubule involves several different types of transporters. We're, gonna, we're just going to learn a few of these through the, diff, through the renal tubule. So the first one that I have here is called a sodium glucose symporter. And it's going to allow for sodium to come into the cell, which then glucose will piggyback a ride in. So sodium and glucose is going to be reabsorbed. That, and they're going in the same direction, so it's called a symporter. The sodium hydrogen antiporter allows sodium to come into the cell, but then moves hydrogen back out of the cell. In this way, we can get rid of hydrogen out of the blood, the cell, and into the filtrate. I'll show you that. 
In the proximal convoluted tubule, there's a water channel. It's called aquaporin 1. Don't confuse that with aquaporin 2s. I'll mention those later. The aquaporin 1s are in the membrane, a protein in the membrane that makes the membrane of the cell permeable for water. Basically, it's a water channel. So here's the picture of the renal tubule cells in a proximal convoluted tubule. This, again, is the lumen of the tube where the filtrate is flowing. So now we just filtered the blood, and we filtered out our sodium. We filtered out our glucose. We need to reclaim them in the proximal convoluted tubule. Almost everything is reclaimed in the proximal tube. So this particular transporter is called the sodium glucose symporter. It allows sodium to come into the cell down its concentration gradient, and glucose, glucose can piggyback a ride in. So glucose kind of goes down a sodium current. Then we have these glucose transporters in the basolateral membrane that transport glucose back out to the blood, where we reabsorbed it from the filtrate. This is tubular reabsorption, transcellular reabsorption. So one point of interest here, the renal tubule cells in a proximal tube are the only renal tubule cells in the renal tubule down the length of the tube that have glucose transporters. So if someone has high blood sugar, hyperglycemia, you filter too much sugar out, you don't have time to reclaim all of the sugar, and when the glucose bypasses the proximal tube, it is destined to end up in urine because no other cells down the length of the renal tubule can transport glucose. So if glucose is in high concentration, then you're going to lose some of that glucose in your urine, which is called glucosuria, which is abnormal. No one should have glucose in their urine. So if our blood sugar levels are up towards 200 milli milligrams per milliliter, which is pretty high, remember somewhere around a, a 90 to 100 to 110 is normal. If you're up above 160, which is the upper limit of the threshold, up to 200, then you're going to lose some sugar in your urine. And when sugar leaves and goes in the urine, it's called glucosuria. Common causes of that is diabetes mellitus, uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. So they're, they have uh, insulin is not active in the body, and their blood sugar gets too high, which means they filter too much sugar out, and it overloads the transporter. The transporters can only work at a certain rate. So some sugar is going to be bypassing as this sugar is being reabsorbed. And sooner or later, you're going to have glucose past the proximal tube and you're not going to reabsorb it. And you're going to lose it in urine, which is called glucosuria. So here are the symporters again, smaller picture, sodium glucose symporter. And we reabsorb sodium and glucose. The antiporter in the proximal tube is called the sodium hydrogen antiporter. So sodium comes in, but hydrogen is going to leave. In this way, the proximal tubule cells have the ability to excrete acid out into the filtrate. So that carbonic acid cycle we learned before where carbon dioxide and water join together in the presence of carbonic anhydrase forms carbonic acid, H2CO3. I know you can't read that, but that's what that is. And it splits up into hydrogen, which then leaves, which is acid, and bicarbonate, which is a buffer that's reabsorbed back into the blood. So in this way, we can excrete hydrogen out, get rid of acid, and we can reabsorb buffer, and we can maintain that higher blood pH, 735 to 745. So here's some passive reabsorption of solutes in the proximal tube, paracellular, transcellular, ions, are, and, and urea, a waste product, can be reabsorbed back into the blood along with water. This is passive reabsorption. Now, in the loop of Henle, the loop of Henle typically is impermeable for water movement. Not the whole loop, primarily the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. So since there is some water that can move, but not much, 
there's very little obligatory water reabsorption, if any, that occurs in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. There's one important symporter that I want us to learn in the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, and that's called the sodium potassium chloride symporter. So let's look at it. So this represents the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle, or the thick portion of the ascending nephron loop, as it's called. So that those cells, those renal tubule cells in that part of the tube, their membrane is pretty much impermeable for water movement. Only a little bit of water can go through these channels that are in the in the membrane. But this is called the symporter, the sodium chloride potassium symporter. And so in the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle, we mainly adjust salt concentration. Sodium and chloride predominantly coming in, coming in, coming in, and then we reabsorb it back into the blood. So what I was mentioning before um, about the tubular glomerular feedback mechanism for the regulation of GFR, if the filtrate moves too quickly through this tube, then you're not going to have time to reabsorb this salt. It's going to bypass the tube, bypass the, the transporters as it's going up the tube too quickly. And then it makes contact with the macula densa up here, and the macula densa says, hey, the salt concentration is too high. So they block nitric oxide production, which causes the afferent arterial to constrict, which reduces glomerular blood pressure and thus GFR, which slows the filtrate back down. And we now can reabsorb salt through our symporter again. Now, in the distal convoluted tubule, we still are involved in reabsorbing sodium and chloride. So we have sodium chloride symporters, but we also have calcium transporters. The distal convoluted tubule is an important site where parathyroid hormone is going to act. If you remember, parathyroid hormone from way back in the endocrine chapter causes the kidney to reabsorb calcium. Parathyroid hormone is released from the parathyroid glands when calcium blood levels are low. So if you're hypocalcemic, you don't want to lose any calcium in your urine. So parathyroid hormone targets the kidney, specifically the distal convoluted tubule cells, and causes more calcium to be reabsorbed in that part of the tube, and thus you save your calcium from being lost in urine. Now, in the late part of the distal convoluted tubule and in the collecting duct, which is a tube that's collecting filtrate from the distal convoluted tubule, there are two types of cells, principal cells that we need to learn about and intercalated cells. The principal cells have sodium potassium pumps that are going to be involved in causing sodium reabsorption. There's also aquaporin-2 channels which are inserted in the presence of ADH. So these, these cells become more permeable for water in the presence of ADH and thus you reabsorb more water in the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct when ADH is released. And those channels are called the aquaporin-2 channels. The intercalated cells are responsible for reabsorbing potassium and bicarbonate and excreting or secreting acid out in the form of hydrogen. So I know that might not make too much sense, so let's look um, at the pictures. Oh, this is just a reiteration. I just reiterated principal cells and intercalated cells here. So let's look at the cells and what the transporters are. So this is the cells in the distal convoluted, the, the last part of the distal convoluted tubule and then into the collecting duct. These are called the principal cells, and the principal cell's job is to reabsorb sodium primarily and, and excrete potassium out. Now these cells have receptors for aldosterone. Aldosterone is released because of angiotensin II. And angiotensin II is made when your blood volume and blood pressure are low. So if blood volume is low and blood pressure is low, angiotensin II is going to try and increase that. One way it does that is by causing the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone. If you remember specifically, the zona glomerulosa releases aldosterone. Aldosterone then targets the kidneys. 
specifically these principal cells, and causes for more transporters to be inserted in the membrane. So you reabsorb more sodium, more sodium, more sodium, and by doing that, you reabsorb more water. So these principal cells reabsorb more sodium and water back into the blood and ultimately increase your blood volume and blood pressure back to normal. At the same time, potassium is going to be excreted or secreted back out into the filtrate. The other signal that causes aldosterone to be released from the adrenal cortex is a high level of potassium in the blood and extracellular fluid. So we don't want a lot of potassium in the blood. That could be very bad. That's called hyperkalemia. can cause you to have a heart attack. So aldosterone basically tells the principal cells to reabsorb more sodium, but excrete or secrete more potassium out, thereby regulating potassium levels in the blood. The intercalated cells have the job of reabsorbing some potassium, but here mainly I want to show you uh, bicarbonate and hydrogen uh, maintenance. The intercalated cells have active transporters in the apical membrane that use ATP so that they can actively secrete hydrogen up its concentration gradient. And so these cells can increase the hydrogen ion concentration gradient in the filtrate by a thousandfold. That means that the filtrate is going to become more acidic. Basically, we're pulling that acid away from the blood and excreting it out into the filtrate. Not only do we do that, excrete out and secrete out hydrogen, but we also reabsorb buffer, bicarbonate, through the chloride bicarbonate exchanger. The chloride bicarbonate exchanger allows one chloride to come in and one bicarbonate to leave, and that bicarbonate gets into the blood and then buffers the blood, pH in the blood, acid in the blood. Now, as far as the filtrate and what becomes urine, there's no free hydrogen out in filtrate and urine. So hydrogen is actually buffered in the, in the urine by two things. One, ammonia. Ammonia is NH3. It can combine with the hydrogen to form ammonium ion, which is NH4. It's a cation. And that's an irreversible binding. So there's no free hydrogen out here. It binds to other molecules, in this case, ammonia which is a nitrogenous waste product. It becomes ammonium ion. The other buffer in the filtrate in the urine that can bind to hydrogen is the phosphate buffering system. This is monohydrogen phosphate, which is HPO4. It's an anion. It combines with hydrogen to form dihydrogen phosphate, H2PO4, and that can be excreted out in urine. So I just wrote here a little bit about ammonia. That's a poisonous waste product from the deamination of proteins in the liver. Um, the deamination process involves cleaving off the amino group off of a, an amino acid. So you can look that up if you want. I just want you to know that deamination, uh, since I can't draw it on the board for you right now, deamination is the removal of the amino group from proteins and amino acids, and it, it produces this waste product, which is toxic. Now, most of that ammonia is actually converted to a less toxic form called urea in the liver, right? All right, so then this just describes a little bit about what goes on in the intercalated cells. Here is the negative feedback loop for the control of uh, osmolarity in the blood or the concentration of solutes in the blood with the volume of water. And... So if we have an increase in osmolarity, that means you're dehydrated, you lost water, you don't have enough water in your blood, the osmolarity goes up. We have osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus that monitor that concentrated plasma all the time. So if the osmolarity goes up, it causes the control center, neuronal impulses, to the control center, which is also in the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary gland, causes an increase in the release of ADH from the posterior pituitary gland. So antidiuretic hormone output causes the principal cells in DCT and the collecting duct to reabsorb more water, basically to produce those aquaporin-2 channels, so you reabsorb more water, and thus 
you're going to decrease your urinary output volume and you're going to be putting more water in the blood which dilutes the concentrated solutes and your blood the blood plasma osmolarity will go back down to its normal level so this reflex goes on and on and on until osmolarity is back to normal all right so here's a summary chart for all of the hormones with their major stimulation modes of action and their effects on renal function reabsorption and secretion I want you to review that we this is just a review on some of the ones that we just talked about so this is all them all in one place so make sure you review the functions and effects of these hormones the last thing I have here is our diuretics I want you to know a little bit about diuretics and how they work everybody knows a diuretic makes you increase your urinary output volume by losing water so if you're dumping more water out in urine you're basically decreasing your blood volume which decreases blood pressure now you may not always want to do that but some things are diuretics like caffeine you go drink caffeine you might have to go to the bathroom more often um, because diuretics ultimately in some form or fashion block the reabsorption of solutes the main one is sodium but there are others so and I'll explain one in a second so caffeine actually blocks the reabsorption of sodium so if sodium stays in a renal tubule there's one statement you should always remember wherever sodium goes water is sure to follow so if sodium is being reabsorbed water is going to be reabsorbed if sodium is not being reabsorbed and it's going through the tube water is going to go through the tube so basically caffeine makes you secrete more sodium and thus more water out in urine and that's why it's a diuretic alcohol is a diuretic because of a different mode of action it's not manipulating sodium reabsorption but alcohol makes you go to the bathroom more often because it blocks the release of ADH in the absence of ADH you lose about 10 percent of that water that you would normally reabsorb and then as you know we have prescription medications or prescription diuretics they can actually operate or work on any part of the tube you probably heard of loop diuretics before so in some form or fashion the different ones alter the reabsorption of solutes they manipulate uh, the reabsorption of, or inhibit the reabsorption of solutes like sodium in which case you flush the sodium out which means you flush the water out <coughs> excuse me so um, I don't know if you ever thought about this before, if you ever know, heard about it before, but one thing that happens with people that have uncontrolled diabetes mellitus is that they urinate a lot. The reason why they go to the bathroom a lot in uncontrolled diabetes mellitus is because they're secreting sugar out in their urine. They're excreting sugar out in their urine. So the more sugar that is traveling through the renal tubule water is going to follow it so if you excrete those those solutes out water will follow the solutes not just sodium it'll follow glucose as well and so those individuals are losing sugar along with water which increases their urinary output volume which also decreases their blood volume and thus their blood pressure all right so that's it for the, the PowerPoint if you have any questions, as you go through this PowerPoint and the video, just email me and I'll get back to you. All right, good luck studying.